All right, folks, let's get started then with symbolic convergence theory and, and fantasy theme analysis. And it's another one of those, uh, I mean, there's so much profound stuff <laughs> going on uh, in this. And, and by the way, the, the first part, symbolic uh, convergence theory, that's the theory, a theoretical framework, whatever you want to call that. And then the fantasy theme analysis is basically the, the way you apply it. So this is kind of the the method, I suppose, and this is the theory based on that method. So uh, the nice thing about this chapter is that it, this perspective combines the two. So you get the theory and the analysis uh, method uh, bundled as one. Uh, and they take the time to explore you know, or explain how to apply the theory, which is something you don't really get, frankly, with uh, uh, Burke and, and, and Fisher. Uh, so that's what makes this really easy to, to pick up and run with. Uh, but it makes a lot of the same... Uh, uh, implications, I suppose, a lot of the same concepts about what it means to be human, what it means to be in a society, what it means to be uh, in a civilization. And it's uh, this idea that we all share as humans, as communities, we, we share a sort of common uh, set of myths, uh, common uh, literature, common set of stories, I suppose. And we use those sometimes to relieve tension, I suppose, but, but it's kind of a way to relate whatever's happening now uh, to something else that's not happening now. <laughs> some uh, bigger picture, something that happened in the past, uh, some kind of creative work. And if you think back to maybe ancient times, prehistoric times, you could sort of imagine, you know, a group of, let's say, ancient Greeks, uh, proto-Greeks, <laughs> sitting around a campfire, <laughs> And they're, uh, you know, maybe they've had a tough day or whatever. And, and somebody says, well, let's, uh, you know, let's think about Hercules. You know, I want to hear that story. Remember that time Hercules uh, did those seven labors, you know, and there was that, you know, he had to clean out those those stables. And, you know, the other Greeks sitting around the fire would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I remember, you know, I know what you're talking about. Go, Where are you going with this? <laughs> well, that was kind of like today. You know, I, I feel like you know, we, we did one of those labors of Hercules today. Uh, just kind of a silly example, but, you know, that's the idea is that no matter what society you're talking about, no matter what group, what community, anywhere, uh, they're going to have these sorts of little stories, uh, myths, legends, or it could just be things that happen uh, to the group itself at an earlier phase. I mean, like, uh, you can find some other videos on YouTube about this theory, and I was, the one I was watching a, a while ago. Uh, the professor talked about how he had been in a band, and the um, I guess there was some big incident that happened. I don't remember where it was, uh, <laughs> Las Vegas or something. Uh, so he was talking about how when he gets together with that uh, his band, he could say, "You remember that time in La we played in Las Vegas?" And you know everybody was like, "Oh yes, of course. How could we forget that?" <laughs> uh, so that's an example of this on sort of a, a local uh, level. But the theory can be applied more broadly than that to, you know, whole society or culture. Uh, and, of course, in The Walking Dead, we see plenty of examples of this in the context of the characters themselves. There's a scene, couple scenes where they're on a boat or they're in a, sitting around a campfire, and they make reference to things that aren't happening right then and there. Right? Stuff that's uh, fictional, uh, things that happened long ago, things that may or may not happen in the future, but it's just making references to things that aren't there in the immediate environment. And so, for example, Dale uh, tells this story about a watch and a dad giving him a watch and the son and all this stuff, and there's some philosophical sayings that go along with that. And uh, then he says, well, that wasn't something that happened to me. You know, this was a Faulkner. You know, this was a novel uh, that I read and really kind of had an impact on me. And you know, you know, it's pretty clear that the other people there, maybe they haven't read Faulkner before, but, you know, this is the idea. He's, you know, at this point he is uh, trying to chain out or he's, he's introducing a, what we'll call a fantasy theme of Faulkner and the story about the watch. And then uh, seeing, you know, he's kind of he's kind of sharing that theme uh, with people that may, it looks like nobody there has heard the story before <laughs> or read the novel. So he's kind of making them conscious of that. He's sort of, uh, you could say he is uh, bringing back the relevance of Faulkner uh, to this situation of the <laughs> post-apocalypse. So it's, it's kind of interesting that literature, fine literature, still is important uh, even in a situation like this. Maybe, maybe more uh, so in a situation like this. And so that's sort of where we're get going 
in broad strokes, and let's see if we can flesh out some of the details of this. Uh, so to start off with, think about some popular media communities. So communities that have worked, I'd call them fandoms, uh, but uh, communities that have formed around some show, franchise like Star Trek, or maybe a game community uh, that's focused on uh, you know, World of Warcraft or whatever the case may be. But, but just think of one of these communities. Uh, do you belong to any such community? Are you on uh, discussion boards related to Star Trek or or um, uh, Twilight or whatever the case may be? Maybe you've done some fan fiction. You know, I don't know. You tell me. Uh, and then what are some of the common characteristics you find among these uh, groups? So any groups you're part of, but similar groups you might not be part of, though. Do you see some similarities? Uh, just think about that for a while. Write up a few sentences and then come back. Okay, so moving on. SET and FTA. Uh, so I think this perspective is most useful when you're studying... Uh, well, you, you could use it for just about anything. Pop culture artifacts. Any show, any video, whatever. But it works better when you've got something with a big fandom. Uh, lots of people who uh, really take it seriously, who make it basically part of their lives, part of their identity. It's not just you know casual <laughs> interest. <laughs> Uh, but they step it up a notch, right? It becomes part of their day-to-day -day life. Uh, you probably know people that are, you might think about it as being obsessed, right? Say, wow, you just really seem to be into Star Wars or Harry Potter or, or Pokemon here. And it's 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 not just, again, being a casual fan, you know, say, oh, I like the, I read a Harry Potter book or two. It was fun. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, this, this is like taking it up to the next level. Uh, so that suddenly that's everything that happens, you're finding some way to relate it to it. something that happened in Harry Potter. And it's just like, well, this is just like what happened in you know the, the, the second book and so on and so forth. Or, uh, everything comes back to, um, to Star Trek or Doctor Who. and you know, They just seem to constantly be thinking and talking about it. And if you get a couple of these folks together, you know, then they really take off and suddenly it gets to the point where, you know, if you haven't seen Doctor Who before, and you get a couple of these Whovians uh, together, and they start getting engaged. Uh, pretty soon, you can't even follow it. It's like, what are you guys even even talking about? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a uh, this perspective is kind of useful when you want to know how did this happen? You know, what what brought these people? Uh, what is it about these artifacts? What is it about Doctor Who that inspired this level of commitment? Uh, how did that happen? And then what's happening here, communication wise? You know, why is it they, sort of, they seem to be speaking their own language? <laughs> and beyond that, does it affect their behavior? You know, when somebody loves, um, oh, Pokemon, uh, let's say when somebody gets to that level with Pokemon, where they're just, it's part of who they are, uh, how does that impact their behavior? And is, is it good for society? Is this stuff we should be, should we be concerned uh, that people, so many people are getting into Pokemon? Or is it actually a good thing? Uh, so this perspective helps you really get into questions like that, really dig in and, uh, you know, start doing some some, some pretty good analysis. Uh, so this uh, concept talks about something called, or this uh, perspective, rather, uh, talks about rhetorical visions. So you see this a lot, shared rhetorical visions. Uh, and to me, uh, that is very similar to what Kenneth Burke talks about when he, he calls it terministic screens remember that sort of a fog of symbols through which you see the world and uh, depending on what groups you're a part of and you really identify with uh, to use some more Burkean language uh, that's going to skew uh, the way you see things playing out in front of you right so you have two different people they, they witness the same uh, political goings on the same commercial whatever it is but since they have different terministic screens uh, they actually come away with different interpretations of, of what it was that they were uh, looking at there. Uh, and the same thing with this uh, rhetorical vision concept. So it's kind of this way of seeing. And it's uh, defined here as a composite drama. So again, they're just like Burke, they're talking about dramas. Uh, that catches up large groups of people into a common symbolic reality. Uh, this common reality is made up of mutual heroes, villains, and storylines. And, and again, I point to this idea of the ancient Greeks 
you know, sitting around a, a campfire, sitting around in ancient uh, Athens, I suppose. And um, they would all know these stories of Zeus and uh, Poseidon, you know, all the rest of the, the pantheon and, and Hercules. They, they'd have uh, uh, Theseus, you know, the Minotaur, all that stuff would be uh, stories that they had all heard as kids and grew up with. And they probably told them uh, many times. So this was kind of their... Uh, rhetorical vision, right? They all shared this. Basically, you could, you could make a case that really to be an ancient Greek, part of that means that you're familiar with, you know, who Zeus is and you know who, uh, <laughs> you know, he's got the lightning bolts that he throws and, and all that sort of stuff. You're familiar with Oedipus. Uh, you know, these, these ancient uh, tragedies, the ancient stories. And, you know, the same is true for us. You know, if you think about your rhetorical visions a while ago, maybe you know people that... Uh, you know, I think about pretty much everybody knows who Superman and Wonder Woman are. <laughs> so some people have argued that that's kind of our version of uh, Zeus, I guess, and uh, Diana. You know, the, these sort of ancient gods have sort of uh, been transmorphed, <laughs> is that a word, <laughs> uh, into comic book heroes. But, you know, the point here is we, you know, we're, we sort of all share these stories in common, these, these symbols... Uh, these these stories, these these themes, and then we can use them to com communicate about new situations. You know, we find ourselves having a problem, and we, we find ourselves needing to uh, talk about something and and uh, compare it to something. And since we all know who Superman is, we could talk about well, you know, this uh, uh, you know this uh, this chemical is my kryptonite, <laughs> or uh, uh, doing a, writing an essay is my kryptonite. You might hear somebody say something like that, and you hear kryptonite. What? What? What is? The, you know, kryptonite is a chemical element. What does that have to do with anything? And then you might say, Oh, come on, kryptonite, Superman. You know, and that was his uh, Achilles heel. <laughs> then you might say, Achilles, <laughs> who is that? You know, there, there we're back to ancient Greek myth again. Uh, you know, but hopefully you're starting to get the point, right? It's, uh, you know, to be part of this culture, we're sort of all immersed in these. Uh, uh, these stories, these fantasies, these themes, and we sort of create with them. You know, I'd say it's kind of creative uh, to say something is your kryptonite, <laughs> uh, but you're kind of building on that uh, shared reality, right? that shared symbolic reality. I mean, it doesn't, Superman doesn't really exist, uh, but he does exist as a symbol, you know, in our, in our culture. Uh, and you can also think, too, I thought this would be helpful to compare. Uh, I know some of you play... Dungeons and Dragons or some variation of that game. And if you think about, or maybe you've seen uh, Stranger Things, you see the, these uh, kids playing this game. And then it's interesting game because uh, it's, I call it shared storytelling. Um, you have a dungeon master or a game master, and that person will be basically the narrator talking about what's, what's going on and what your character sees and what, what's happening with the dragon <laughs> uh, and so on and so forth. But the players... They kind of contribute to the story, right? So they say, well, okay, you said there's a dragon over in, the, in this cave. Well, my character will go into the cave, bravely saunter into this cave, you know, shield held high, <laughs> you know, singing a song to, um, oh, who, uh, who's the guy in there, Paladine or whatever. Um, so they're kind of adding to that story. They're they're sort of sharing, they're, they're being creative too, I guess. So it's not just the dungeon master. They're all sort of creating this story themselves as a group. And furthermore, the more they sort of sink into their characters and develop, um, they might start bringing some of this stuff outside of the game. Uh, so you play in this group long enough, and a matter of fact, if you watch Stranger Things, you notice they reference the, they say, oh, this is the Demogorgon. You know, it's that character, it was that monster that was in the game. Um, but they're talking about it outside of the game, right? Using it as a metaphor for other things. <laughs> of course, uh, I won't spoil the, uh, the show for you. But, but anyway, uh, the point is it kind of impacts them outside the game, right? Their behavior, their way of talking, um, the groups they're part of. Yeah, and even like moral compass, their confidence level. You know, a lot of people see that the benefits, there are benefits of playing D&D. &D. Uh, and one of those, arguably, is it makes the uh, kids, or adults now, <laughs> more confident. You know, you're kind of experimenting with different roles. Uh, you're having some success on your quest. 
And that might bolster your self-confidence, your self-esteem a little bit. It might encourage you to uh, get outside of your comfort zone. Not just in the game, but, you know, outside of the game. And so that's, that's really all, I think, a good way to start thinking about this. If you think about a and d game just writ large, uh, I think you're kind of in the right zone uh, to be thinking about this uh, symbolic convergence theory. All right, so let's look at some of the terminology, or how do you apply this theory. Uh, so FTA, then, is this, this will be the methodology we use to identify, understand, and interpret those converged symbols. So you think about symbolic convergence, and, and these uh, different symbols, different stories coming together. Or is what you know, the symbolic convergence means. You have your symbols, I have my symbols, but we share these symbols, we share these uh, stories together, and that's what allows us to be a community or a group. Um, so some of the terms are weird, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, so this one is called a fantasy theme, and it makes you think fantasy. I always think about Dungeons and Dragons, which I just did. Uh, dragons, you know, that sort of magic, uh, that sort of thing. But it's not doesn't mean that here. Uh, instead, it means a basic unit of communication, like a joke, analogy, metaphor, etc., some kind of symbol, basically, uh, that when shared with others constitutes the basis of social reality. Uh, so it's not doesn't necessarily have to be again a, a tangible thing like a you know a real dragon. <laughs> Uh, but in a sense, dragons are real because we all know what they are. Uh, we can use that as a metaphor. You, you've seen pictures, you, you've read stories, you've seen movies, etc. So it kind of becomes real in the sense of uh, social, right? It's, it's something we can talk about, we can refer to, we can make a joke about. <laughs> I can you know, say, so and so is a dragon, just breathing fire. You know, you know what that means, right? It's it's a way to communicate. Uh, and then Borman defines them. This is straight from Borman. Uh, so I like to, uh, how he defines uh, fantasy theme, and he says they're the creative and imaginative interpretation of events that fulfills a psychological or rhetorical need. So I think Borman's definition is more helpful, actually. And so it's not just something like, oh, there's some chapstick over here, and that's not really a fantasy theme. Or it's, uh, I think the book uses the example of it being hot outside. Say, it's hot. It's hot today. And that's not really a fantasy theme. That's not really, there's nothing creative about that. You're not imagining it being hot. <laughs> it actually is hot <laughs> or cold uh, since it's Minnesota. Uh, so instead, instead of just saying, it's cold out here, that's boring, right? They say, how can I be a little bit more creative, be a little bit more imaginative? You know, I want to say it's cold, but I, I don't want to be boring. I don't want to be bland. So you might say, it, it is, you know how cold it is? It, it's like that movie. You know, I feel like the guy in uh, the Fight Club where he's dreaming about the penguin. <laughs> and the, he's in the Antarctica somewhere. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that, that was a pretty crappy example, but, but you get the idea, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So the kids here playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons, they refer back to that game and stuff that happened as they're playing that game in many different, you know, many different events that happen on the show. You know, they have this experience in common of uh, playing D&D &D and they can link back to that. You know, I do the same thing with uh, my friends. We'll talk about that when we get to symbolic cues. <clears throat> now, chaining out uh, is an interesting way of putting this. <clears throat> uh, the idea here is that somebody does something, says something creative, something imaginative, and then somebody else picks it up and runs with it. Uh, so if you for example, I walked into the class and says, wow, everybody looks very tired today. <laughs> Did you get bitten by zombies on the way to class? <laughs> uh, and somebody might laugh about that and say, um, yeah, you know, that this is true. Maybe, um, um, you know, I got bitten uh, here on, the, on my arm and now I'm starting to crave human flesh. <laughs> you know, something along those lines, right? They're kind of picking up this metaphor and... and, and adding to it, uh, and somebody else might do the same thing. So you might say this is sort of chaining out. And so this started just as something creative, uh, and then other people pick up on it. And it's, again, just like that D&D &D session, you know, when the DM says, you see a dragon over in the corner, 
uh, the players would say, oh, there's a dragon. Well, I'm going to stab the dragon with my sword. <laughs> so they're kind of chaining out. They're buying into the narrative. right? They're, they're going along with it. Uh, I see this. If you see little kids playing make-believe, maybe you remember doing this yourself, and you're just sort of making up, oh, I'm in... Uh, you might see uh, some kids playing, uh, in, like they're cooking food in a kitchen, or they're having a fancy tea party with, <laughs> you know, the teddy bear or whatever. And some other kid might come along and, and get involved, you know, and share this this fantasy, right, with this this sort of playtime uh, with their friends. But, you know, the argument here is we don't really ever stop doing that. <laughs> you know, you think about it just as being something for little kids, but in fact, this is how we communicate. This is how we form communities. Uh, and yet another example is uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, so you think about these, they start off a lot. In matter of fact, this is true. A lot of conspiracy theories if you really look into how they get started, a lot of times they just start off as a novel uh, or as just a story somebody told. It was fiction. And nobody, everybody thought it was, nobody claimed it was real. <laughs> this is like a fictional story in a novel or something that happened in a movie. Uh, but then other people will come along and they'll, they'll pick up on that and uh, say, oh, new wave of Elvis sightings. You know, I, I think I saw Elvis one time. <laughs> you know, I was in Nashville and, you know, then they sort of uh, add to this story right somehow. And then somebody else might say, well, now that you mention it, you know, there was an Elvisy looking uh, person and <laughs> I've heard this and uh, people might start adding to this theory. And, and pretty soon it's not just uh, something fun that somebody was just kind of daydreaming about uh, one day, but it becomes this you know, uh, conspiracy theory, theory, and maybe hundreds or thousands or sometimes even millions of people uh, uh, buy into it. So I don't know if the Elvis, <laughs> this Elvis conspiracy theory, I, you know, I don't know what real harm it could have um, to society if a lot of people bought into this. I, you know, I guess you could, <laughs> you know, uh, some people just say conspiracy theories in general are harmful because of it makes you more susceptible to believing other, you know, dumb ideas. <laughs> uh, but, you know, some of them are clearly uh, dangerous. All right, fantasy-themed components, then. Um, so, again, there's a procedure you follow when you're describing your artifact. So if you wanted to look at a, a Walking Dead, for example, you have what they call dramatis personae, or personae. A couple different ways to pronounce this uh, word. Uh, but it's basically the cast of characters. So who are the characters in this drama or in this story? Uh, you know, in the case of The Walking Dead, there are many, but you could you, you might say, well, there's many characters in The Walking Dead, but there's two that are really the kind of stand out as being uh, the main characters, at least in this uh, first season. Uh, you could say uh, Rick, he's sort of the hero. He's the, the good guy. He's a protagonist. That's what that word means. Kind of the, the, the person you're rooting for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whereas the governor, you know, it's a, there's a little bit of gray there, you know, uh, but I think most people would agree he's he's not the good guy. <laughs> he's kind of the bad guy. He's the villain. Uh, you don't really want to be like him, emulating him. Uh, he's the antagonist. You know, and another way to think about this is these are the characters, the antagonist is trying to stop the protagonist. So the protagonist has something he's trying to accomplish. Uh, the antagonist wants to stop that from happening. And so that's another way to look at this. They're, they're opposed to one another. Uh, so once you've identified the characters, you can talk about the uh, plot line or what's, what's happening in the narrative. You know, how do we get from uh, point A to point B in the story? Things happen along the way, right? Uh, that's the plot line. And the plot lines will have a scene... You know, where is this taking place? When is this? Uh, what's What led up to this? What's happened in the background? What's the context uh, of this plot line? Uh, obviously, in The Walking Dead, uh, the scene is very significant, you know, especially in, in this confrontation between the governor and, and Rick. You have this, this prison and Woodbury, and, of course, it's uh, in the uh, midst of the apocalypse. And it's a uh, you sort of live in constant danger because a zombie attack could happen, a horde, <laughs> massive attack. <laughs> you know, law has broken down. 
Uh, so I would say, really, in a zombie narrative, uh, the scene is critical. Okay, another important term with this perspective is the sanctioning agent, which means the legitimizing force that guides the narrative. Uh, so this is kind of similar to what Burke was talking about with those uh, uh, the purposes and the motives. Right? He talked a lot about what's motivating a character to do something. Uh, I remember, too, he talked about how you uh, get expelled from a group because of your sins, and then you got to seek redemption. Uh, so this is somewhat similar to that idea, right? This is, you know, what makes it okay to be doing what we're doing? What are we following uh, to decide between right and wrong or appropriate and inappropriate? Uh, and the book gives some examples like God. You say, this is what God would want us to do. You know, this is what my religion tells me is right. Or maybe the characters are on some kind of quest. And they say, well, we need to do this because this will get us further to achieve, or, like the D&D group, right? You say, we need to do this because this is the quest we're on and this will get us closer to uh, achieving that goal. Uh, the Constitution, right? You say, well, this is, that's unconstitutional what you're trying to do there. <laughs> Uh, or you could say, I, sh I can do this because it's, you know, the Constitution is what uh, sanctions this activity. Uh, or some kind of event, code of ethics, personal experience, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I looked at some of the other studies that have been published that use fantasy theme analysis. And one of them uh, that's pretty popular, pretty well known, was a study of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, so they looked at some of the uh, books to go along with Alcoholics Anonymous. I forget which one this one is, like the big book or something like that. Uh, but this author was noting that the sanctioning agent at alcohol, for Alcoholics Anonymous tends to be personal experience. Uh, so somebody gets up to, to speak, you know, their story, they're telling you what happened to them, uh, how they fell into alcoholism, or how their, you know, their struggles, basically, their, their, their lived experience. And the reason that or what, what sanctions them to speak and, and to be respected and listened to is their personal experience. You know, so they always, it's kind of like the ethos, if you want to go all the way back to, to Aristotle, you know, this idea of, uh, I'm sort of, I know what I'm talking about here because I've been through this before, right? I've been at the rock bottom, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I joined uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I became sober, and I've been sober now for, you know, however many years. And you think, oh, okay, well, that, you know, that sanctions that agent, right? That provides them some uh, justification for speaking, right? Okay, so you have all these different kinds of rhetorical visions, you know, everything that, uh, from a game of D&D &D to movies to uh, those fandoms like Star Trek and uh, God, what else? Harry Potter, you, you name it. Uh, so these authors say, or I guess Borman, and says you, there's really, though, just three basic categories or three main types. Righteous, social, and pragmatic. So in, a righteous, or in the righteous master analog, uh, this is about doing things correctly. So it stresses the correct way of doing things with its concerns about right and wrong, proper and improper, superior and inferior, moral and ir immoral, just and unjust. Uh, so I think a show that I always think about in this context is something like Judge Judy. You know, it's literally a courtroom, <laughs> and it's, you know, what you did, you're guilty, or you're innocent, right? Or you're, you, you did something very improper. Uh, you need to be held accountable for that. You know, so it's like the righteous thing to do would be to act just like Judge Judy. <laughs> you know, she is righteous. Uh, all the people she judges have, uh, they're not righteous. All right, so she's the, you know, the sanctioning agent there is, of course, like the law and, you know, like the moral code, good sense of ethics. Or, you know, Batman. If, if you think about Batman, he's kind of an interesting example because in some ways you'd say he's doing things improperly. You know, he's not a, you know, usually in any way, he's not like a licensed uh, detective or, you know, a police officer. Uh, and yet he's, he's fighting crime. But I think you would say he's certainly a very, at least in most of the versions, a very moralistic hero. You know, he's, he's fighting for justice like Superman. 
All right, so that's the righteous. The social, uh, this focuses more on friendship, trust, camaraderie, brotherhood, or sisterhood, uh, and being humane. And so with that one, you know, you've got a lot of reality shows that fit this profile, right? It's not necessarily about doing things properly or be doing things legally or righteously. It's, it's more about uh, being a good friend, you know, and, uh, you know, enjoying, I guess, relationships, uh, you know, being, being loyal, helping your brother out, <laughs> you know, that, that sort of thing. Or being a, you think about all those movies, they call them buddy movies, right? Uh, <clears throat> I was just thinking of one. <laughs> it left, left my mind. <laughs> uh, Sylvester Stallone and uh, Kirk Douglas, or Kurt Russell. Oh, what is that one? Tango and Cash. Uh, or shows like Sons of Anarchy. You know, this one's quite dark. You know, a lot of criminal elements in that. Uh, but if you watch the show, I mean, they talk a lot in there about, like, this is the, like a family, uh, the... the uh, the other people in this uh, motorcycle club, um, they're not just random people. Uh, they're, they're more than friends. I mean, we're like brothers here uh, in this motorcycle club. You know, that's what that show is about. A lot of times the various members of the club will do things that kind of uh, get them ostracized or, uh, you know, put, it, put out of the club for a while, kind of pushed aside, shunned, I guess, and then they'll have to do something to try to win back uh, win, win themselves back into that group. Uh, and then the pragmatic master analog. So this value is expediency, utility, efficiency, persimony, simplicity, practicality, and cost effectiveness. Whatever it takes to get the job done. Uh, so for that, I was thinking, I think the book uses the example of uh, home improvement shows. You know, there is people, there are plenty of people that, I think I mentioned this before, that like to watch YouTube how-to videos. So they, they just get addicted to watching YouTube. You know, here's how to change a tire. Here's how to replace a transmission. <laughs> Even though they have no real desire uh, to change out a transmission or whatever the case may be, uh, it's just kind of entertaining for them. Uh, they, they enjoy this kind of uh, show. Uh, but I was thinking of things like Man vs. Wild. You know, it's kind of almost a Robinson Crusoe-like element to, to some of these uh, shows, right? You, you think, what if I was on that island and I had, you know, just a pair of coconuts? <laughs> you know, could I survive? Uh, you know, and to me, that, that kind of fits that profile. Or, or something like MacGyver. You know, if you watch that show, and he's from Minnesota, by the way, uh, Richard Dean Anderson. Uh, but the, the the fun the great thing about that show is it's kind of like how do I, I I'm stuck in this problem or I'm in this situation, you know I've got to use my brain to figure out how to you know get out of this cell or <laughs> how to make a uh, how to make a car engine out of these spare parts you know whatever the case may be so I think that's I'd put those in the pragmatic category or going back to the D and D you know D and D games have these systems they call alignments lawful good chaotic, evil, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think you could also use these. You could say, well, like the classic paladin, sort of the champion for truth, you know, kind of divine-like hero. I'd say that's kind of the righteous character. And then you have these bards who are, they're kind of the life, the soul of the party, right? They, they play the instruments, they keep, they tell jokes, you know, they keep everybody feeling good. Uh, they're there to kind of bolster the, the confidence of the party. You know, I'd say this is kind of like the social one. And then the pragmatic to me would be like the rogue. You know, the, these thieves, they don't mind breaking the law sometimes. They're not necessarily evil. Uh, but, you know, they're going to get the job done, even if it means uh, breaking some laws. Right? I mean, they're about being efficient, uh, not fancy, not necessarily... Um, they're kind of in the shadows, right? <laughs> not about being flashy, you know, getting all the credit for things. All right, so let's uh, have you uh, think about some of the characters from The Walking Dead. And you don't necessarily have to do 100, all of them. Uh, just pick the ones that you think fit these profiles or these master analogs the best. So who's kind of the most righteous character, who's the most social one, and who's the most pragmatic? Okay. 
Uh, another part of this perspective that's that's fun in my opinion is thinking about rhetorical visions as a, as a cycle. It's here to come and they go. They're here and now they're not here. Kind of fads that come and go, uh, movements that come and go, trends. Uh, and, and they say this is true for any of these visions. And it's just a, a simple cycle. Right? You, at the beginning, it has to get created, obviously. Uh, this is sort of how it's all forming together. You know, you think about that D&D &D group. Uh, and, hey, let's play D&D. &D. Uh, do you know how to play? <laughs> Come on, we'll figure it out together. You know, we'll, we'll just go have some fun with this and uh, go kill some dragons. Uh, so that's the formation. Uh, and then the consciousness raising as newcomers are attracted to the... Uh, you know, whatever it is, right? So maybe you bring in some new players. Um, maybe you're talking about the game and it gets uh, other people involved. Some people that play D&D, &D, for example, Raymond D. Feist is a good example. And I'm pretty sure George R. Mar George R. R. Martin. Not 100% sure about him. Uh, but a lot of times these uh, fantasy novelists, they start off playing Dungeons & Dragons with their friends and then they basically take those stories and, and create novels uh, out of that experience. So the characters in the novels will be based on stuff that they got up to in their game. So that's one way this could happen. Or it could just be like with The Walking Dead. You know, you have this, maybe at a, at a high school, let's say there's a couple of uh, the kids that start watching it. Uh, they start telling other people about it, and pretty soon, you know, you got a lot of people that know about the show, right? Um, the show is getting more and more popular. Word of mouth. Uh, hey, what's this Walking Dead thing? Uh, I keep hearing about that. Maybe I should watch it too. You know, so then you become part of the group. <laughs> now you're starting to share this vision. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's sort of the final phase before it goes into decline, and there might be efforts to renew it, to revitalize it, to keep it going. Uh, so again, with Walking Dead, you know, you had that first season. It's getting more and more popular, more and more people are watching it. And then AMC says, you know, we should renew renew this for another season. <laughs> uh, you know, let's keep this going. Hey, uh, this, we seem to have a tiger by the tail here. A lot of people are really loving what we're doing. Let's keep it going. Uh, but we need to do something to renew it. Uh, think about sequels. Oh, everybody loved that uh, Wonder Woman movie. Let's make a sequel. <laughs> keep it going. <laughs> keep it sustaining. Uh, or it could be, you know, many years. Maybe everybody's forgotten all about it, so you need to just completely revitalize it. You know, up, up it pops again. Maybe many years have passed, but you find some way to, to bring it back to relevance. You know, a lot of times, uh, movies will do this. It's just like out of nowhere, suddenly this movie's popular again. It's been, uh, you know, maybe this movie's on Netflix now. Or maybe this old game is back on uh, Steam. You could say it's kind of been, it's kind of been revitalized. It's, it's been sustained. All right, criteria for choosing a text to analyze. That's, of course, step one. And what should you, what can you analyze with this? And they say you got to look for three things. Uh, one is shared group consciousness. So is there evidence of a rhetorical community and audience buy-in? So is anybody paying attention to this? Uh, is anybody playing along with it? Uh, and again, coming back to the D&D &D group, uh, if it was just the one kid that was, oh, look, I'm imagining dragons and all this. That's just sort of something that kid's doing, and there's not, there's not a group <laughs> uh, there. It's just him or her, right? Uh, on the other hand, if it's a, you know, if this becomes like the next Lord of the Rings, and you know, a lot of people are engaged in it, and talking about it, and thinking about it, uh, you know, sharing this symbolic convergence, uh, you'd say, okay, there's some evidence of that. Uh, and then they talk about this rhetorical vision reality link. So basically the question here is, are they just thinking and talking or is there stuff? <laughs> is there something you can point at and like hold up and say, here, here's some evidence uh, that there's a rhetorical vision or that there's a shared group consciousness. And I think a simple example of this would just be the merch. You say, well, like with the Swifties example, or like a, I had a student that did a symbolic convergence theory a thesis. Her, her thesis was based on this. And uh, she looked at Taylor Swift and the Swifties, basically super fans of uh, Taylor Swift. And, you know, part of this was, well, you can prove that there's a big group of, uh, you know, fandom here because they're, they're buying up this merchandise, right? The, the, the shirts, the products, uh, of course, the, you know, the songs, the CDs, 
record albums, <laughs> whatever whatever she's putting out, they want to buy. Uh, clothing, you know, T-shirts with the logo on it. You know, all of that stuff is kind of... So basically here you're saying that they're doing more than just talking about it or, or thinking about it. All right, there, there are things in the real world, tang stuff uh, that you can point to as evidence. Uh, and then uh, three, fantasy theme artistry. Uh, this is kind of a general question. Like, do you really want to be spending your time analyzing something that's crap? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, so you say, well, what does it mean for something not to be crap? Uh, so they have three standards for saying something like that. As uh, so you could say, absolute. Uh, so this just would be, everybody would agree, this is a fantastic song. Uh, you know, think about the Beatles. You know, almost everybody loves <laughs> the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to find somebody that would say, they, well, they kind of stink. Uh, if you heard that, somebody say, oh, the Beatles are terrible. You just think, eh, whatever, you know, you're just saying that. You know, give me a break. <laughs> it's just, just kind of like it's just the songs themselves are just absolutely good songs. Uh, or you could have this comparative uh, standard where you're saying, well, the, the, it, compared to similar bands, you know, the, this holds up pretty well. Uh, compared to similar shows, you know, as, as far as sitcoms go, uh, Everybody Loves Raymond is, is great. <laughs> You're kind of comparing it to something similar to it, right? Uh, and then the closeness of fit standards. Uh, how well does that individual theme, or a, an individual theme, work within a larger vision? Uh, so kind of going back, I guess, to the idea of... Uh, uh, they use Big Bang Theory in, in the in the book, but if we think about, like, say, crime, criminal investigation shows, uh, procedural police dramas, uh, CSI, you know, that sort of thing, uh, you might say that uh, you might, as a culture, uh, we sort of have an idea from those shows about how uh, how that works, how that looks. You know, what is it like being a crime scene investigator? Uh, so you've seen all these other shows, so you feel like you got a pretty good idea. Uh, so when a new show like that comes out, uh, you could watch it and you could say, well, either that, that fits very closely to what I believe, you know, what we sort of uh, uh, feel like the CSI situation looks like. Uh, or you could say, this doesn't fit at all, right? It's clear this person had no idea uh, of what they were talking about. <laughs> These writers had no uh, clue what they were doing. So it doesn't really... Uh, you know, feel very close to the reality or to that shared symbolic reality uh, that we had. Uh, and there's lots of examples we could talk about there. I know I've used the example of dragons. You know, dragons are these fictional creatures, but we feel like we know what they are. And if a show, a fantasy show or a novel came out and it was too different, you know, if it didn't fit what we think of as a dragon, we just wouldn't be able to say, that's just that's crappy, you know, that's not a dragon, that's a, that's a horse, or that's a cat, uh, you know, that's just a big cat, that's not a dragon, you know, so, so that really violated that, that third standard. Uh, okay, so step two, um, oh, so this is when you actually sit down to write the thing, and so you start off, you say, who's the characters, what's happening, what's the scene, and what's the sanctioning agent, you know, again, how are they justifying their actions? What, what's motivating them? Uh, and then the fantasy type. Uh, they give a couple different examples of this. Somewhat confusing, I think, but, uh, you know, it could be a genre. So, like, a, they talked about how, um, like, sitcoms, situation comedies. Uh, there's, I don't know, hundreds of those things. Uh, so you could identify it. You could say this is uh, an example of a uh, sitcom. You know, that's the fantasy type. Uh, they also say, though, you can go into the formulas of those genres and talk about the, uh, I call them tropes instead of fantasy types, but uh, nevertheless, if you watch these shows like Cheer, this is a pretty good example from the book, of Cheers and Big Bang Theory. I don't know if you've watched both those shows, but there's a lot. Office is another one. But a lot of these shows will have this uh, uh, this this potential couple, uh, like Jim and Pam from The Office. Ah, cheers. Who is that? Uh, <laughs> I'm like I always blank on the names when I'm just uh, looking at these things. I think Sheldon and uh, 
Penny. Uh, is that right? Leonard. Leonard and Penny from Big Bang, if I have that correct. Uh, but anyway, the names really aren't important. The, the important thing is you have these this pair that they sort of want to get together, but there's some reason they can't really get together. And it's kind of awkward sometimes. You can you can tell there's sometimes they seem like it's going to happen, but then it doesn't happen. You know, another, another example of this, not a sitcom, uh, but the show X Files. You know, with the uh, God, what's that guy's name? Uh, Mulder and Scully, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, same sort of thing. So you see that sort of situation cropping up in a, a lot of different kind of shows because it's it's a nice formula uh, that works well with audiences. Uh, so that's the fantasy types. Um, the symbolic cues, you know, just going back to this fantasy type for one more minute. You know, if you think about Western movies and horror films, you know, you can also say you could identify a lot of uh, uh, stock scenarios in those. You know, the uh, the woman running a, running away and, of course, slipping down <laughs> and falling, <laughs> you know, being pursued by a monster and slipping and falling. So that's a, a common scenario. You've seen that in 100,000 uh, horror films. Or, you know, the westerns, the, you know, that moment when they meet uh, out in the street for their, uh, the shootout. You know, all of that sort of thing. It's a fantasy type. Uh, the symbolic cues, this one's kind of fun. Uh, so these are cryptic allusions to common symbolic grounds. And the idea here is it's cryptic. And the best place to see these are memes. So here's one that I've just found just by typing in Walking Dead meme. And this popped up, and it's kind of funny because it's actually referencing a couple of different uh, symbolic grounds, I suppose. Uh, so, of course, you know the character. Actually, you might not know if you haven't seen all of The Walking Dead, but this is a character called Negan. Uh, he comes much later in the series, but he's, he's fairly uh, <laughs> a fairly distinctive uh, character. So you'd see this meme, and you'd recognize this character if you watch The Walking Dead. Uh, and then this cash me outside, I think that's, uh, God, what is that, uh, Dr. Phil, I want to say, this kind of silly uh, thing that chained off from a Dr. Phil episode. <laughs> I've actually watched the, the clip a few times, it's pretty funny. Uh, so this, this meme here kind of combines these two things, and if you, it's funny if you recognize that, if you know that little Dr. Phil segment and the... Uh, watch The Walking Dead, you're like, aha, this is, this is great, great meme, it's funny. Uh, on the other hand, if you didn't know The Walking Dead and you hadn't seen this Dr. Phil clip or, or know what this cash me outside business is, you'd just be puzzled. Like, what, what, is, what is that? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so the reason this is important is if you have these symbolic cues and, and people are getting it, uh, that's pretty good evidence that you do share this uh, rhetorical vision, right? We, uh, if you didn't share it, if you if you didn't uh, share it, if if we didn't have this in common, you would just wouldn't get the joke, right? It would just you know go right over your head. <laughs> you might just find it annoying. Um, so that's that's the idea behind the symbolic cues. Another way to think about them, by the way, is, is triggers. Uh, so if you hear somebody make a reference to something and you're like, oh yes, that that brings up some memories. Uh, so if you hear a certain song, right, and you think, oh, that song is from this movie, Footloose. Oh, I remember that. Remember, um, you know, when that uh, dance was happening? Uh, all of that sort of thing. Okay, the implications then, to wrap this up, remember all the perspectives have to end up with saying, uh, what difference does this make to anybody? <laughs> uh, what's the point? Uh, who? Why should we care about this? Uh, and so for this one, it's pretty obvious why. Uh, because we're saying these shared uh, or the uh, the fantasy themes and the these shared uh, symbolic convergences actually change the way people behave and believe and they're doing stuff in the real world, right? They're, uh, they're really going out and buying things or they're doing activities or whatever the case may be. It's it's having an impact on real life, not just uh, fiction. Uh, so some of those, if you delve into those a little bit more. Uh, they talked about the founding fantasies, uh, so the stories of like uh, about us. You know, how did this group come about? Uh, so with the like the Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, you 
part of that is learning how did this get started, right? And who created Alcoholics Anonymous? And you, you could read about that, and that becomes part of the story of how this uh, movement, you know, moved out of just being like a discussion, and I guess some books, into this real-life thing where people are uh, changing their behavior, right? They're not drinking alcohol. Uh, but the same thing is true for all these other uh, groups, right? Uh, hidden agendas. Uh, so are there members of the group who have ulterior motives? Uh, so they may technically be members, but they don't really share the vision. And uh, so I was thinking about this one a little bit. And, and often think about this one. Well, just you know, to go back to our example earlier with the uh, with the D and D, for example. Uh, maybe you've got somebody that's playing Dungeons and Dragons with you, but they're just they're just there because you know maybe they like somebody in the group, uh, or maybe they want some you know quality time with that person. Uh, they don't really like the game. They're not really buying into anything. They don't even know their character very well. Uh, you know they're not really engaged. Uh, you might think, well, why is this person even here? Uh, or sometimes I get students in these comments, even like you know at the end of these lectures, I'll say, do you have any comments? Do you have any questions? And, you know, most of the time it'll be, uh, you know, the questions or the comments will seem to pertain to something we talked about. You know, they'll be chaining it out, what I'm talking about. So they'll say, oh, you know, I really like this lecture. You know, by the way, when you were talking about, uh, let's just pick one. Uh, the, these visions, maybe, they'll say, that reminded me of uh, this comic book that I read. You know, you're talking about Batman. I, I was thinking about Aquaman. <laughs> you're just throwing that out there. So they're kind of chaining it out, you see. It's this chain reaction. They're finding new ways to apply this and expand the, you know, uh, expand it. Uh, but there's always that student or two who's just like, man, that lecture was boring. Uh, that went on for a long time. Uh, you know, this is only a three-credit class. There's, there's too much reading in here. <laughs> it's, just all, it's always something like that. And eventually, you get, I get, as a professor, uh, I just start thinking, why are you here? You know, you, you don't seem to be interested in the subject matter. Uh, and then you find out, well, they just need a credit. <laughs> you know, big disappointment. It has nothing to do with, uh, you know, they're not genuinely interested in the subject matter. Uh, they just, you know, basically had to take a class, and this was the only one they could get into uh, to satisfy that requirement. And so you could say that student had a hidden agenda. <laughs> You sort of assume they were here to learn and enjoy the class, uh, but really they had some other ulterior uh, motive. Uh, okay, uh, that's all for this uh, lecture. I <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah, so now that I just talked about that uh, hidden agenda, uh, please uh, do ask a question and make a comment. You know, I know there might still be some things that are confusing about this. Hopefully not. Uh, so just let me know whatever it is you're thinking. And love to read those and help you if I possibly can. Uh, but we'll, we'll leave it there and see you next time.